From the campus of Utah Valley University in Orem, the Utah Debate Commission welcomes you to the 3rd Congressional District Candidates Debate. Good evening. I'm David Magleby, and I'm honored to accept the invitation of the Utah Debate Commission to moderate the debate between the two major party candidates in this year's third congressional district race. We are live on the campus of Utah Valley University in Orem, Utah. Tonight we will hear from the incumbent Republican Jason Chaffetz and his Democratic challenger Brian Wanacott. Each candidate receives a two-minute opportunity for an opening statement. And prior to airtime, it was determined that Mr. Wanacott would have the first opportunity. Mr. Wanacott. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. It is, it is an honor to engage in this discussion so that voters can make the best decision. My objective to carry out the wishes of my constituents. I am not a politician. I am a problem solver. I would like to do my part for Utah. I do not consider myself running against Mr. Chaffetz as much as I am running against the do-nothing Congress of which he is a part. Back in 1948, President Harry Truman ran against what he called a do-nothing Congress. If Harry had known of the performance of the last Congress with Mr. Chaffetz, he would have given his Congress a medal. Time Magazine says the previous Congress was the least productive in history. The current Congress has done even less. Time Magazine goes on to say, polls suggest the public is disgusted with Obama, disgusted with the GOP, and completely nauseated by Congress. That is unacceptable. Mr. Chaffetz will tell you that the House of Representatives has been passing lots of bills, and it's Harry Reid and his Senate Democrats who have stopped action. That's not completely wrong, but you should take into account that the House spent hours and hours debating and passing bills they knew could never survive. And when they ran out of doomed bills to pass, they went back and placed, passed another bill to repeal Obamacare. They did that over 50 times. It never occurred to them to pass a bill to make it all work. There was a time when the House passed one version of a bill and the Senate passed another version. They formed a conference committee, negotiated their differences, and then came up with a bill that could become law. This not, does not happen in this do-nothing Congress. I say let's start over by electing representatives who are less interested in politics and more interested in solving problems. I will join such a Congress. Congressman Chaffetz, your opening statement. Well, thank you, and I, I thank Dr. Magleby. I, I actually took a, took a class from Dr. Magleby uh, once upon a time. I, I think I passed that class, at, but the, the more things change, the more they stay the same, uh, answering questions from you tonight. But I want to thank Utah Valley University. Thank the students are here. My daughter's a student here. Uh, I also want to thank my wife for being here, and uh, this is a wonderful university. I have a son at the University of Utah. It's a new phase in our life, and I have a daughter who's still in, is still in grade school, in public school. It is an honor and a privilege to serve in the United States Congress. The issues before us are very weighty, very weighty. There are so many things that we need to deal with. But I believe in my heart that the United States of America is the greatest country on the face of the planet. But it requires us to tackle difficult issues. It requires us to actually take votes on difficult issues. I believe the path forward is to adhere to the United States Constitution and to stay true to the, what I believe the core conservative principles of fiscal discipline, limited government, accountability, and a strong national defense. You get those right, this country moves in the right direction. I look forward to the debate tonight. We should have more debate. We're not supposed to agree on everything. The founders set up our, our constitution in a way that we can have this vigorous dialogue. So I do appreciate my Democratic colleague here who's uh, putting his hat in the ring where others wouldn't. And I appreciate you stepping forward and, and doing what others wouldn't do and having a discussion about the issues. And that's what I look forward to tonight. Thank you, Congressman. The Utah Debate Commission has established a format that allows each candidate 90 seconds for an initial response to questions posed by citizens to the Utah Debate Commission website. The first question tonight goes to Mr. Wanacott. It is from the Utah Debate Commission. 
The first cases of Ebola have been reported in the United States. What can we do to secure our borders against threats such as the Ebola virus? How much taxpayer money would you uh, want to spend and what measures would you take to make sure that our borders are secure? Mr. Wanakot. Ebola really is not a, a border problem. It's a problem of um, discovering where people are coming from, from overseas, and managing their uh, association, with the pe association with the people that they uh, come in contact with. Uh, there are border problems. I'm not sure that uh, increasing border security will really accomplish what we want to do as far as general immigration reform. Uh, I would say that we need a more a broader based report uh, approach. The the Senate bill is a very broad based bill and maybe too broad, but the Republican bill really that only addresses one little issue that's a small part of the immigration problem. And we need to s see that more than just touching on the edges is done to actually solve the immigration problem. Mr. Chaffetz, the question about Ebola and what can be done to limit its impact in the United States. I do think we're going to have to limit travel. I do think we're going to have to have more vigorous screening at the ports of entry. Uh, this is largely a problem that's coming out of Africa, but usually comes through portals uh, in Europe. You need to have those people screened on those airlines before they get on those airlines. We need to attack it right at its source. You have to be able to go in there, and I do think it is a wise use of, of federal uh, taxpayer dollars to be able to help those people on the ground who want to help themselves in some of those most affected areas. This is a disease that can spread like wildfire, and that's the deep concern. But you've got to tackle it where it's at, limit the ports of entry, have vigorous screening there, and the Centers for Disease Control has to employ and, and, and educate people as to how this virus spreads and what you can do to protect yourself against it. Let me ask a follow-up of each of you, given the mention of the Center for Disease Control. What specifically do you think the Center for Disease Control can do, a federal agency, and the Department of Homeland Security to be sure people are not boarding planes? One minute each on this response, please. As uh, Mr. Chaffetz said, really the problems come from dealing, from uh, controlling the approach, I mean, controlling people who come into the country. The Center of Disease Control can very uh, successfully address uh, the problem once it gets here, but it's not their problem until it does. I, I would like to attack the problem at its source, and the Centers for Disease Control has some of the best medicine, the best doctors we have in the world, educating a largely third world populations on how to prevent the spread of this disease. It's devastating in these, in these countries, but they're very basic hygiene, the idea of, of making sure that you don't share meals, maybe the way they're used to, to sharing meals, that that would help prevent the spread of this virus, that would go a long way. So teaching, educating, helping them to help themselves so that it gets right at the source and it doesn't become a worldwide pandemic, uh, that, that's, that's what I worry about, is this is gonna hit from shore to shore of every continent, and, and we have an opportunity as a leader in the world to actually educate people and teach people how to make sure that this disease and other diseases, quite frankly, uh, don't spread like the wildfire that they can. Our next question will be from William Sheehan, a uh, student at Utah Valley University. It will go to Congressman Chaffetz. Mr. Sheehan. Okay. Uh, recently, large protests in Hong Kong have placed China in the spotlight. How do you feel our government should proceed with U.S.-Chinese relations? Well, thanks, William. I appreciate it. I went to China not uh, too long ago to look at port security and whatnot was what's happening in the ports there. Uh, I think the, pr the president gave a speech over a year ago, I actually agreed with, which talked about the need for, a, for an Asia pivot, that so much of our attention as a nation has been on the Middle East and the conflicts there. But if you look at the long-term implications of what China is doing, with the incursions in the South China Sea, the problems that are created in Hong Kong and Taiwan, the, the, the aggression in North, North Korea and how the Chinese 
Chinese might engage there, working with our partners in Japan and South Korea. These are all very complicated issues. We have more than half of our U.S. Navy, for instance, patrols the waters in the Pacific, helping not only the South Koreans, the Japanese, and, and Singapore and whatnot, trying to make sure that the Chinese encourage into the Spratly Islands, the, the Danger Islands, those shipping lanes that are so vital for commerce. We can be a leader, and we need to make sure that our president and the United States Congress is crystal clear, no ambiguity what is acceptable and what is not. What I worry about with President Obama is he's given up a lot of that credibility. He set red lines and then he hasn't adhered to them. The world does not believe President Obama. That's a problem. I believe in, in strength, that a strength of the United States of America actually leads to a more peaceful world. And you have to be able to communicate with China. We have an awful lot of commerce with China. But it is unacceptable for them to treat people in the human rights that they have it is unacceptable for them to just sort of clamp that down. We have problems with them bombarding us on a daily basis, trying to get at our IT infrastructure and, and all the things we have with cybersecurity. There are a lot of issues with China, but I actually concur with the president, agree with the president, we should be pivoting and thinking a lot more about China because they are a major, major partner, but they can also be a, a major problem for the United States if not dealt with properly. Mr. Wanakot, and I'd remind you both of time, please. Be attentive to the clock. I agree in almost every sense with uh, Mr. Chavitz. Um, we uh, have not been paying enough attention to China, uh, and it is a big player in the world. Um, it's, it's just exciting to see these young students uh, doing what they're doing in Hong Kong. They are showing great courage and great restraint. Uh, they are cleaning up things better than it, better than the streets are cleaner now be, after they've been there than they were before. Um, and they're trying to make sure that their protest does not devolve into something that's gonna cause uh, danger and uh, catastrophe. They, they are really making a very powerful statement in what they're doing. Um, I wish them so well. I, a few years ago, did go to China myself. A wonderful tour. Uh, Hong Kong is gorgeous. Uh, Hong Kong is a very sophisticated city, and it's a wonderful place to be. It's, it deserves uh, to have the freedom that the students want. And uh, I'm just wholly behind everything they have, are trying to do. A quick uh, follow-up question. One item, please, only in a 30-second response. What's one thing the United States could do to assist these protesters in Hong Kong? Congressman Chaffetz. Enable them through social media, media to be able to communicate with themselves. I, I'm wholly supportive of their ability to communicate and express themselves, and the United States of America can help them in doing that. We offer some of the greatest products and services that are born here in the United States, and I would just encourage and cheer them on and let them know that we support them. Mr. Wanakot, one thing the United States could do to help the protesters. Yeah, they really need to know that we support them. Uh, they are making a great statement about what it's like and what, how important it is to have a free society. And the stronger that statement can be, the better it will be for all of China. So our next question, uh, it's from uh, Shia Haskell of Spanish Fork. Uh, it is as follows, and I'll go to Mr. Wanakot first. In light of recent security breaches at the White House, what do you think is the most pressing security issue for our nation or our homeland? And what steps would you take to secure the nation? Mr. Wanakot. Um, as far as the White House, I thought that the uh, security service, while missing completely the entry of this fellow into the White House, showed a great deal of courage and restraint in taking down this individual. Um, I know that Mr. Chaffetz thinks they should be, have taken stronger action. I'm thinking that if they had sh actually shot this individual that he would be complaining about the XFU excess use of violence. Um, it's clear that there are problems in the Secret Service. I mean, and that 
and that we that there are morale problems and that there are things that do need to be addressed at this point uh, I'm hoping that there will be better funding I'm hoping that uh, there will be additional training and, and, and new approaches to the way they manage the security of the White House. Congressman Chaffetz, the question of breaching the security at the White House. That can never, ever happen. The United States Secret Service needs to know that their mission is to make sure that nobody, but nobody, gets to the president, his family. They don't get into the White House. They don't get to our embassies. And if somebody can't get in front of them, if a dog can't get in front of them, if whatever countermeasures aren't working, then I want those Secret Service officers to know we got their back because they're going to have to take down that threat. In this day of ISIS and ISIL and terrorism and whatnot, you don't know what's underneath that person's clothing. You don't know if they have an improvised explosive device or some sort of bomb. But these. These, uh, these incursions are totally unacceptable. I've been looking at the Secret Service for more than a year as the chairman of the subcommittee on national security and the oversight committee. I, we have problems with leadership, about protocol, about training, and about culture. And for the Secret Service, they're going to have to, to address those. I talked to this, the new Secret Service director just this afternoon, and he knows that we're, <laughs> they're not above oversight. This is the proper role of what the Congress should be doing, is providing some oversight. But for Americans in general, Terrorism is a real threat. We have to understand that it's a real threat. I don't think the president did the country in his, any good service back in September of 2012 when he said that Al Qaeda was on the run. They weren't. They were growing and expanding, and other terrorists were, were blossoming up. We're going to have to attack this problem at its source and hope that it never comes to our homeland. Thank you. The next question uh, comes from a student. Uh, uh, Japheth um, uh, McGee from Provo, another UVU student. This one will go first to Congressman Chaffetz. Mr. McGee. Um, what can we do in terms of tax reform to prevent, prevent companies like Burger King from acquiring foreign companies to, lex to lessen their tax burden in the United States? Well, thanks for that question because uh, yeah, we love Burger King. They got the best. Uh, they got the best onion rings out there, and you don't want to see them go between become become a, a Canadian company. But nevertheless. They are a private entity. They can do what they want to do. And I don't think you can force them and coerce them to come back. You have to create an atmosphere in the United States of America to be the very best place that people want to do business. Right now, we have, as a nation, the highest corporate income tax in the world, bar none. We are absolutely off the charts. Democrats will often argue that in order to tackle the debt and deficit of this nation, we're just one good tax increase away from prosperity. That's not the way it works, folks. You have to make the United States of America as competitive as you can possibly be. Corporate income tax reform in dealing with that, bringing that rate down, broadening the base, lowering the rate, I'd like to see that, that rate come down to 25%. That's a reasonable, achievable goal. You also can look at the repatriation of money a, a, a across the world. We have very vibrant companies across this nation, and some of them right here in, in, in Utah that can't bring their, their dollars back to the United States of America because of the double, double taxation that they face. So you want to see an infusion of capital by the billions, literally tens of billions of dollars, then address that problem overseas of being able to bring those, those receipts that they get overseas and bring them back to the United States of America. You do those two things, that will go a long way. But we need, we need a lot of reform. We need certainty. The overregulation is a problem. Capital is resistant to making investment where there's uncertainty. And in the United States, so much talk about what we're going to do with raising tax rates creates this uncertainty. It exacerbates the problem. And then you got good companies who decide that it's a better opportunity for them to go overseas as opposed to thriving and growing right here in the United States. Mr. Wanakot, a minute 40 if you'd like it. Thank you. Um, Countries are making the wrong choice, and it's sad to me to see that they're losing their way. Um, we do need to provide better incentives for countries to stay in the United States. Uh, I, I hope, I agree in most respects with, with uh, Mr. Chaffetz that we do need to provide incentives to encourage companies to stay. It's, oh, taxation is not the answer, uh, I, but it, it's incentives and, and just a, a 
a, a, a philosophy and a behavior that they need to change as far as they as far as thinking about whether they're an American company or not. Thank you. I sense that you agree on this question, so let's go to the next question. Uh, it's from Kathy Reed in Salt Lake City. Uh, she asks, and this one will go to Mr. Wanakot first. Many homeowners across the country are still trying to recover from devastating impacts of the recession. What do you think Congress should do to prevent another housing bubble from happening? And specifically, what would you do about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Mr. Wanakot. Um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are are kind of uh, institutions that we depend on, and they have been forced into positions that are unfair as far as uh, what they are expected to do. I I I'm believing that I believe that the housing bubble is really past us it's it's not uh, it's not what we need to be addressing right now there's a lot of economic concern but the housing bu bubble is behind us uh, I guess I, I guess I don't know what I would do about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac Congressman Chaffetz um, specific to, Kit, to Kathy's question on, F on Freddie and Fannie, they uh, should gravitate over the course of time and become a private institution. I just don't believe in the quasi-government status that they have, and I don't think that's in the best interest uh, of free markets. And really, I'm a, a free market person. I also think that they should be subject to more transparency. Right now, if you were to issue a Freedom of Information Act request on Fannie and Freddie, they don't have to answer it. That's wrong. I actually introduced some legislation to say, let's make sure that Fannie and Freddie are subject to FOIA requests. It's the way Americans, it's the way everybody, the media, whatnot, can actually look under the hood. Uh, somewhat similar to that, I believe in that we should be auditing the Federal Reserve. That I, I, Ron Paul sponsors a piece of legislation. I was the 13th person to sign on to it. Transparency, sunlight, will solve an awful lot of problems as we move down, move down the road. But if you want to get more people into more homes, you've got to have jobs and economy that's singing. And we have to have a recognition that it's not government that creates jobs, it's people and entrepreneurs and businesses that create jobs. We do not have the type of atmosphere that we need in this country to grow jobs, and consequently, people have a tougher time getting into to homes. Let me ask a follow-up of each of you, because I sense that Ms. Reed's question uh, goes deeper than that. It's not just Fannie and Freddie, but it was the banks and the subprime mortgages uh, and et cetera. So no, one's gone, no one has gone to prison uh, for this. There have been substantial fines and penalties imposed on major banks. Uh, what do you think we should do, back to her question, to avoid this happening in the future? Um, is the legislation that's already been passed enough? Would you do more? Mr. Wanakot. It's clear that we haven't done enough. Um, there has been almost no banker has gone to prison. Uh, there has been almost no penalties le leveraged, recent penalties there have been. Um, it's, it's clear that the Republican Congress does not want to uh, address this problem in a meaningful way. Uh, there were definitely uh, uh, security uh, creations that were just uh, just weak and corrupt, and there was nothing that was done about them. Uh, I guess it's clear that we need to do more as far as uh, addressing the corruption and the uh, that has occurred in the banking industry. Congressman Chaffetz. Too many people were getting too many loans, people that couldn't afford their loans, and, and it was fundamentally wrong. It's a little unfair to blame the Democrats after the fact to go back and enforce the law. The Democrats had the House, the Senate, and the presidency for, for two years. They, they owned this. I don't think that on either side of the aisle, when I talk to my Democratic colleagues, that they're happy that that uh, Eric Holder and the Department of Justice has not held people more accountable. There were literally tens of billions of dollars of fines that were issued. Where'd that money go? It's actually something our committee is actually investigating. I haven't said that out loud before, but where did all that money go? We're, we're going to look into that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from a student, uh, Callie Tate, 
of Utah Valley University. This one will go to Congressman Chaffetz. In light of the Marketplace Fairness Act, what are your perspectives on taxing people who order from online retail from an online retailer? Sorry. Uh, thanks, thanks, Callie, for the question. To me, it's a basic is issue of fairness, and it's also about states' rights. If you're standing in a single place and you decide to purchase a good in your own state, you might have to pay tails, sales tax. Some states have no, some five states have no sales tax, but in Utah, we do have a sales tax. But what if you actually purchase that same good, that exact same service from the exact same place? Should you have to pay any sort of sales tax? Well, the answer is yes. It's actually current law that you're supposed to pay a use tax. Problem is most people don't pay it. I don't believe that the federal government should come swooping in and try to dictate what's going to happen in each individual state. I do believe in a version of the Marketplace Fairness Act. The one that came out of the Senate is not one that I can support. Uh, there are 12 adjustments that I would make. I've out outlined those working closely with Senator Durbin, the Democrat in the Senate, and my colleagues in the Judiciary Committee trying to come up to a resolution. But there are things that I think we can put into place for online retailers to protect them against states trying to come in and start to tax them and whatnot. But the issue to me is, is one of fairness. And the second part of that is it's the, up to the state of Utah to figure out what they're going to do. Utah should make those decisions. I don't want some bureaucrats back in Washington, D.C. trying to come up with that solution. Does that mean we're suddenly going to tax the Internet? No. No, it does not. But it does mean that the state of Utah be able, ought to be able to make more of those decisions right here in Utah. And let's have a fair, even playing field. I think that's the right principle. Don't support what happened in the Senate. But a version of that, I think we can get to a happy medium. Mr. Wanaka. Yeah. Um, I uh, agree with Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, we definitely need to deal with, with uh, cross-border uh, purchases. And it seems that we aren't doing anything about that now. Uh, I think that the Senate bill is probably going to uh, make a difference, but there are obviously some changes. That's all I have to say. Let's, uh, uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, it's from David uh, Folland uh, from Sandy. Uh, this set of questions deals with a variety of topics. Uh, the others have been a little bit more focused topically. Many assert that global warming is occurring and is caused by human activity, primarily the burning of fossil fuels. What is your position on this issue, and would you support legislation to reduce greenhouse gases? Mr. Wanakot. It's uh, clear that there is global warming. Uh, ask the polar bears and the seals. Um, it's also clear that uh, we're not doing enough about it. Uh, it's in, in the 70s, there was uh, an oil embargo which caused uh, major oil producers to refuse to sell us oil. After that embargo, there were uh, long lines of vehicles waiting to get into gas stations all over the East Coast. Uh, it was terrifying to see our country on its knees held hostage uh, to the Middle East. Um, immediately after the energy crisis, there was a flurry of efforts to encourage energy sufficiency. There were rebates. Uh, for energy improvement on houses. New cars were getting more efficient and housing designs were, were uh, for more, more self-sufficient houses were being created. When the emergency was over, we abandoned most of those uh, efforts and technology that looked promising never came, became reality. We now know that there's nearly that nearly half of the oil that ever was is gone, and the current fracking e efforts are holding gas prices at bay. But it's expected that fracking will be gone within five to ten years. Um, we cannot solve the energy crisis simply by expanding exploration and drilling. We must support research for renewables and alternatives to oil, and we must establish incentives to encourage everyone to be more efficient. Congressman Chaffetz. I believe that the Al Gore de defined global warming is a farce. I, I really do. And do 
Is our air and is our quality of life affected by what we throw into the air and in the water? Yes, of course. But the Al Gore defined uh, global warming is a farce. It is. Um, I believe in an all of the above energy uh, solution. I, I believe we should be pursuing every single one of those types of things from nuclear to coal. We have abundance of coal right here in, the Ut in Utah. Can we push for cleaner types of coal? Absolutely, absolutely. What we haven't had in this nation for years and decades on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, is we have not had a national imperative to become energy independent. And that's that should be our goal. I'm tired of sending our money and then consequently our men and women in the service uniforms overseas to try to keep open shipping lanes to bring us more oil. We're gluttons on oil. Pursue all of the above, become energy independent. That's what we should be doing to move forward. And let's be very cautious of what we put into the air and into our water. Of course it affects our quality of life. The uh, premise of David Fallon's question, I think, is that the scientific community agrees there's a problem. So a short answer, please. Mr. Wanakot and Mr. Chaffetz, how much confidence do you have in the scientific community's views on this problem? Mr. Wanakot. Um, years ago, I saw, I read about a uh, public relations company that, uh, well, let me, s short answer. Uh, I watched uh, an interview with the CEO of, of General Motors where he said uh, the climate problem is there is no science to support the climate problem. The next day uh, we saw public relations campaigns all over the country that were uh, broadcasting that message. It's my belief, I'm absolutely convinced that this message is a public relations campaign uh, for uh, automobile companies to so that they could gener so that they could uh, continue to sell high margin vehicles. Short answer, please. I, I don't believe that the science is conclusive. In fact, you read now that the polar ice crap is actually growing. It's at some record levels, and so. <laughs> Weathermen have a hard time telling me what the weather is going to be like next week, uh, let alone what it's going to be like in 100 years ago or what it's going to be 100 years from now. So we have to be very cautious what we put in our air, what we put in our water. But let's become energy independent. Let's pursue natural gas. Let's pursue our coal and make it cleaner. Let's pursue nuclear energy. Let's do all of those things. The world will be a better place. As we reach the midpoint of our time tonight, I welcome you to once again uh, to this live debate between candidates for Utah's 3rd Congressional District. We're on the campus of Utah Valley University in Orem, Utah. This debate is part of a series of five live televised debates for Utah's four congressional seats and the Office of Attorney General. A bipartisan group of citizens, media outlets, and universities have joined together to provide you, the voters, a chance to learn more about the positions of the candidates. Tonight's questions are drawn from questions submitted to the Utah Debate Commission at their website utahdebatecommission.org. We invite you to be part of the process and provide questions you would like to see taken up at a future debate. Also, the website has the schedule for all future debates and will provide an opportunity for you to watch completed debates on demand. Now back to our uh, debate. And this question goes to Congressman Chaffetz. It's from uh, a student, Adrienne Hawkins, who I think is not with us uh, tonight, so I'll ask it for her. Here is her question. I am a student at UVU. Including the 31,000 students on this campus, there are approximately 72,000 students in the third congressional district attending institutions of higher learning. Would you support legislation to make college more affordable and to address the student debt crisis? Congressman Chaffetz. Well, thanks. One of, one of those students at Utah Valley University in that stat is, uh, is my own daughter, Ellis, and she's starting her freshman year. I'm proud of her, and she loves the university and is excited about it. But I do worry about the debt that you may incur getting your education, not just for our family, but all families. And, and, and what are those students going to do? Are they going to be able to find a job and be able to pay off that debt? One of the things that happened in the Obama administration is that they moved the, the process of giving student loans solely under the government's wing. And I worry about that because it doesn't have the sort of competition that you had before, where we had other institutions competing in order to give these loans to people who have the most promising careers ahead of them. 
Are there things that we can do legislatively? Yes. Are there things that the universities can do? Absolutely. And a lot of that goes to the state of Utah and other states around the country to make sure that we aren't building these kingdoms and, and monuments to, to individuals that we're actually focused on educating kids and making sure that they have worthwhile careers, that they can have a thriving career and be able to pay back some of those loans. But the cost of education, we're fortunate in Utah. We're better than most states. But I tell you, it, it is far too high, and, and it, it is a worry. Mr. Wanacott. Yeah, it, it, the cost of education is enormous. Uh, my daughter recently graduated. Um, we put away what we thought was plenty, and it wasn't enough. Uh, I have a friend who's now 60. He still hasn't paid off his uh, college loan. Uh, we do need some help. Uh, we uh, we uh, the oh boy, I'm struggling here. Uh, I guess what I would say is that education is absolutely essential and everybody needs to have the opportunity to have it and the cost of education should be something that can be managed and managed without taking away people's lives. Let me ask a follow-up question of you both. Uh, with respect to what might be done, there have been some initiatives taken by the Obama administration to score different colleges and universities in various ways, making costs more transparent, to require textbooks to be ordered in ways that are transparent to students and, and their parents. Uh, are there any specific things that you would do beyond what's already been done at your level, the federal level, the congressional level, that might help here? Congressman Chaffetz, 30 seconds, and then Mr. Wanaka. I just don't believe the federal government's going to figure it out. Leave it up to the state of Utah. Leave it up to President Holland. Leave it up to the people that are here in Utah, and I guarantee you they will do a much better job of figuring out. It's how I feel about public education. There shouldn't even be a federal department of education. Let, we, know, we don't need Common Core. We can figure this out in Utah. I wanted to repeal No Child Left Behind. Let Utahns figure this out. We don't need a federal bureaucracy to solve these problems for us. Mr. I'm tempted to uh, talk about a different problem. I mean, different uh, focus. Common Core is not the federal bureaucracy. It is a coalition of uh, governors who have come together to create a common a set of requirements that uh, talks about where our students should be. It, it was intended to help our students know how they compared with other countries around the world. It has nothing to do with the federal government. Uh, there is no mandate from the federal government. There is no, uh, it, it is not tied to any fees or benefits from the federal government. Uh, the curriculum is created by the, the the curriculum is created by the local states. Uh, it is not a federal program. Let's go to the next question from Virginia Rollins in Cedar City. This one will go to Mr. Wanakut first. The scandal involving inadequate care at VA hospitals was more than mismanagement. I think she quickly acknowledges mismanagement was a big part of it. What would you do to help the thousands of veterans who served in our military and armed forces? And specifically, will you vote to authorize more expenditures for VA hospitals? Mr. Wanakot. Uh, VA hospitals are absolutely critical that we provide the best care possible. These people have uh, given so much. Uh, and yes, we do need to provide better funding and better oversight and we need to change the culture of paranoia and uh, that caused this problem in the first place. Uh, I absolutely want to, will support anything that makes the Veterans Administration better. Congressman Chaffetz. We are not taking care of the men and women who are taking care of us. They're doing all the heavy lifting in this country and then they come back and they're not being taken care of, now from the mental health standpoint as well as the physical standpoint. 
One of the things that I think is vital is that we tap into the expertise and the healthcare system we have throughout Utah. We had this horrific case where we had a person named Braxton. He lived in Scipio, and he had been hit by numerous uh, shrapnel in an IED case. He had dozens and dozens of surgeries, served months in the, in the hospital at Walter Reed. He came back to Utah, and guess what? It took him almost, almost a year to get into the system for the VA, so he had the privilege to go up into Salt Lake and get his care that he needed. He has a lot of hospitals that are a lot closer with people who care about him. There's no reason why. And if it costs more money at the federal government, then this is the type of money that we should be spending. But Braxton and people like Braxton should have been able to access health care much closer to him and not rely solely on the VA. This, this is what you get when you get big federal, federal health care, right? This is what happens. And that's why I'm so vehemently against it. It has to change. We're failing those people who are serving us. Let's go to the next question, um, and this one will go to Congressman Chaffetz first. It's from Andrew Brown in Orem. On July 30th, 2014, Andrew writes, the U.S. House approved a resolution to sue President Barack Obama for exceeding his constitutional authority. Do you feel this was a wise use of time and resources? Since the proper course, Andrew, suggests of action would have been legislative, and that would be impeachment and a trial, not a lawsuit. Congressman Chaffetz. I, I, the remedy that we have in the House of Representatives, I voted for that piece of legislation. I believe it's the right piece of legislation. When we have a conflict between the legislative branch and the executive branch, our remedy is through the courts. So if we have to sue the president and take it to the courts, nobody should be offended by that. I'm offended the way President Obama has handled this. I think any president that stands up and says, I have a pen and I'm going to use it, if the Congress doesn't do it, I'm just going to do it myself, that should scare everybody. That's not the way we run this country. Our founders set up a constitution that was supposed to be difficult to move legislation through it. It wasn't supposed to be easy. That's why they have the House and the Senate and the process that we have. We have done a variety of things, and one of the things in suing the president and authorizing a lawsuit, we did it on Fast and Furious. We've actually scored some victories there and moving the ball ahead and having some rulings in our favor by allowing us in the House of Representatives to see and test what really is executive privilege on the documents that they have. So. The remedies through the courts, it's long, it takes far too long, but it is part of the remedy that we have in order to, to resolve our differences. Mr. Wanakot. It's clear to me that all of these efforts are really just stunts. Um, they are attempts to make the president look bad. Uh, he, the reason he takes these efforts, it, it takes these uh, actions is because nothing is being done. If the Congress really was working, if there was some action really happening, this would not be necessary. Uh, everything he has done has been because he had no other choice. And he's given no other choice, and so they try to sue him for it. It seems a total waste of uh, congressional time and effort and is actually just counterproductive. Let me ask a follow-up. Uh, given the fact that uh, President Obama's executive orders do not exceed in number other presidents who have preceded him to his, this point in his administration, what is actionable or the result or a reason for a lawsuit in this case that wasn't a reason to sue George W. Bush or Richard Milhouse Nixon or William Jefferson Clinton and some in the Republican Party have urged that these offenses, including executive actions, should warrant impeachment, which is really the essence of the question. So, Congressman Chaffetz, should Congress impeach President Obama, and are his actions out of line with other presidents? I have not uh, called for the impeachment. I know a lot of my, my constituents would actually like to see that. I don't think it necessarily rises to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Is it fundamentally wrong? Yes. Should the Congresses of past dealt with that? Yes, I wish they would have. I wish, going back to Reagan and before, they had dealt with it. I can only answer for the time I've been there. I was elected at the same time as President Obama, and I just believe that it is out of control. It is just too much. And the attitude that the president has is to just say, look, it's my way or no way. I mean, what my Democratic colleague says is, well, he had no other choice. Yes, he did. 
It's through the legislative process. That's how we operate in this country. And it may be difficult, but he, he, he barely tries to go through that process. We have passed in the House of Representatives more than 360 bills. Some of them we passed out unanimously. I have two bills that I passed out unanimously. They still sit in the United States Senate. Mr. Wanakot, on the impeachment question and on whether this exceeds other presidents. Uh, impeachment would be absurd. Uh, and in fact, this whole suit is absurd. Uh, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of the taxpayers' money. It's unproductive. It's uh, the kind of behavior that is, is, speaks for what's happening in Congress today, that nothing is, is happening and everything is just for show. Uh, we need change that actually makes a difference. We need people to work together. We need uh, Congress to think about the fact that they, are, they work for us, that their job is to get things done. Let's go to the next question. Uh, it's submitted by uh, Danica Blauer, and this will go to Mr. Wanakot first. Given the recent events surrounding guns at schools, what is your position on teachers carrying a concealed weapon on campus at their school? And do parents have the right to know if the teachers, lunch workers, and bus drivers are carrying guns? I think parents have the right to know. Parents have, to have the right to know of everything that goes on in their school. Uh, I also think maybe teachers have the right to carry guns. Uh, it's legal in Utah. Um, and until it becomes, until that changes, they have that right. I have friends who carry guns. My brother-in-law carries a gun. Uh, I respect the right of th carrying guns, and I am actually thinking of getting a concealed carry permit myself. I don't own a gun, but I think it's good to know what uh, what it's like, what it's about to have guns in this society. Uh, I worry that a teacher carrying a gun might have that gun taken away from them. Uh, that's a serious concern. I think it's foolish for a teacher to be doing that, but I think it's their right. Congressman Chaffetz. Uh, I, I agree that uh, parents have the right to know everything that's happening in that school, and absolutely they should know that. But we got some teachers that have a hard time, you know, negotiating a Bunsen burner. So I don't know that a firearm for every teacher is necessarily the answer either. So uh, we, we've got to find the, the right balance there. But I do think for some teachers in some schools, in some instances, it's probably the, the right solution. One of the things that happened shortly after that tragedy in Connecticut, I went there. I went to, to Connecticut. It was hard. You know, you start you start hearing and seeing, feeling what that community went with, went through when all those kids were, were killed. You, you, you know, it, it gives you a different perspective when you feel it in person. The mental health part of this equation is not being properly addressed. It is not being addressed. There is a lot more we can do to make sure that people with mental illness who can't make rational uh, decisions are not able to access guns. And I worry about that at the local level. I think there's a national role to play here. And it's something that's a difficult balance and we're going to have to deal with this community by community because the mental health funding at the county level, for instance, here in Utah is going down. But we have more and more people who have very serious, real mental health issues that should not have a gun. And I was proud of Governor Herbert because when we brought this to his attention, we weren't giving the people who were prohibited from giving guns. We didn't have those going into the national database, but now we do, and he did the right thing. Let me ask a follow-up. This is a question that's on the minds of many people. What, if any, limits would you put on the right to own guns, uh, or let's take the word right out, using guns, any kind of gun, any time, any place, by any person? I think this went first to uh, Mr. Wanakut. It's clear that we don't want our police to be uh, to to have less firepower than the people they are dealing with. Um, it's clear that there is almost no control about how guns are sold in in uh, in many places. 
we do need to be careful about uh, guns. I respect the people who uh, conceal carry. Uh, they have spent time and learned how to use our gun, hopefully. Um, I have talked with people who say concealed carry teachers sometimes seem like they are looking for a fatal incident, but there are others who are just very caring about what is the proper use of a gun. Uh, we need to have people who carry guns need to know how to use them, uh, and we need to accept the fact that there are guns in a society and learn how to deal with that. Mr. Chaffetz, any limits? The, the right to bear arms is crystal clear, and I wholeheartedly support it. Where I think there are some limitations is when you lack the mental capacity to make a rational decision. I also think if you um, are involved in the commission of a crime, you're going to lose some rights, some short-term and long-term rights that would prohibit you from also owning and using a, a firearm. But I believe that if you're a legal, lawful citizen, you live in this country, you're a citizen of this country, your right to bear arms... It's crystal clear. You have the right to do that. We have reached the end of our allotted time for questions to the candidates and now move to one-minute closing statements. Prior to airtime, it was determined that Representative Chaffetz would have the first one-minute opportunity. Congressman? Uh, I can't thank you enough and the people of Utah for giving me this opportunity to serve. It's been an honor and privilege. It's hard. It's difficult. I've cast nearly 4,000 votes, but I hope I've demonstrated that I put Utah first, that I helped represent Utah to Washington, not Washington to Utah. And that if we can adhere to those principles of fiscal discipline, limited government, accountability, and a strong national defense, those are the right principles worth fighting for. Fight for the Constitution. Fight for Utah. That's what I want to do. That's why I ask for your vote. I need people to get out and vote. Don't assume that this thing is over. Get out and vote no matter your age, no matter your party. Engage in this system. I'm Jason Chaffetzen, and I ask for your vote. And I thank you for having this debate tonight, and I thank you for having the guts to, to be here. Thank you. Mr. Wanakot. I'm not religious, but my family is devout. Um, months ago, while having dinner with my sister, she pulled up a Book of Mormon app on her phone and read about Mosiah, where it tells us to not to think the beggar has brought his problems upon himself because everyone is a beggar before God. As I listened to her read it, I found it as profoundly moving as anything I had ever heard. As I thought about it later, I thought, this is what Democrats believe. If it, if it moves you, you might be a Democrat. It speaks profoundly to the softened heart. My recommendation to all of you, do not vote a straight party ticket. Make a real decision about the political candidates. I have met the Democratic candidates. There is none of the anger and elitism that permeates, permeates the radical right of the Republican Party. Please consider voting for me and other Utah Democrats. For myself, I am sick of the political posturing we see nationally with both parties and locally in Utah legislature. We are all sick of grandstanding and political posturing. Do not vote for anyone who uses posturing as a political tool. Think about this when you vote for your congressman, your congressional representatives, and when you vote for members of the Utah legislature. I am Brian Wanakot, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. My thanks to Congressman Jason Chaffetz and Mr. Brian Wanakot for their participation this evening. On behalf of the Utah Debate Commission and you, the citizens, I express appreciation to the administration. President Holland is with us tonight, the faculty and students of Utah Valley University for hosting tonight's debate. The Utah Debate Commission reminds you the next debate is next Tuesday, October 14th at 6 p.m., featuring candidates from Utah's 4th Congressional District. If you would like to attend that event at the University of Utah or have a question you would like to submit for consideration, remember to visit the Utah Debate Commission website at utahdebatecommission.org. Vital to retaining our more than two-century-long experiment with self-government is your participation by voting. We often celebrate the Constitution on the 4th of July, but many fail to take the time to inform themselves and vote. It is reported that as the Constitutional Convention concluded, having agreed on our most important governmental document, a woman asked Benjamin Franklin, what kind of government have you given us, Dr. Franklin? A government or a monarchy? 
Franklin answered, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Participation by voting is one way we affirm our commitment to self-government. Each of us has the opportunity to vote for the candidate of our choice on November 4th. I urge you to exercise your right and vote in this year's election. In Orem, I'm David Magleby. Please join me in thanking our candidates.